Hello, I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from around the world. And tonight, we will be talking about Venerable Pope Pius XII, his efforts to save the Jews before and during World War II, and why the negative public image of him still persists. Our guest tonight is an historian who spent 12 years researching thousands of documents in the apostolic archives of the Vatican. And he compiled evidence to counter the past 50 years of propaganda and calumny against Pope Pius XII. Joining us from our EWTN studios in Cologne, Germany, he is the author of a new book, The Pope and the Holocaust, Pius XII and the Vatican Secret Archives. Please welcome Dr. Michael Hesemann. Dr. Hesemann, welcome. Thank you very much. Greetings from Cologne, Germany. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank you so much for your book. Over the last 20 plus years, I've done a number of programs about Pope Pius XII. And my guests were using the best evidence they had available, mostly from newspapers and historians. Your book is going into another level of depth. You were able to go into the Vatican's secret archives, now called the Apostolic Archives, because most folks think of secret in a different way than, than Latin. And as a result, they misunderstand it. The secret archives are simply the Vatican's, you know, uh, private or personal archives. So now it's just called apostolic archives. And you, along with a number of other scholars, both pro and con uh, Pope Pius XII, have been allowed to go into those archives and look up and write about and even copy original documents going back to the time well before Pius XII was Pope, back when he was Cardinal Pacelli and was the Vatican's ambassador in Germany. So uh, to the kingdom of Bavaria specifically, but for Germany itself. So thank you for that very hard work and superb scholarship. Thank you. Thank you for your very kind words. And indeed, you know, when you want to reconstruct history, you have to go back to the roots. You have to go back to the wells of, of information. And um, you can only do it by research in the archives, where you have documents from the very early beginning of the career of Eugenio Pacelli, when he, as you said rightly, was the nuncio in Bavaria. And um, it was, let me say, a sign of divine providence, but he was in Bavaria just in the right time to be prepared for Hitler, because when he was the nuncio in Munich, Hitler began his rise to power. Um, his party started. And we have the first mention of Adolf Hitler in a letter he wrote to, to the Vatican in uh, 1923, uh, where he already spoke about the anti-Catholic character of the Nazi party and, of course, condemned their radical anti-Semitism. And in 1924, he already called National Socialism the most dangerous heresy of our times. So this was really giving you an idea of how clear this man was and how clear he saw the danger of National Socialism to both the Catholic Church and the world. And it's very important to note that he was, in fact, endangered by the Nazis. They recognized 
that he could see through them. He understood that National Socialism, which a lot of folks don't realize, but Nazi is a shortened form for National Socialism. Uh, the party was the National Socialist Workers Party. And he could see through it. He was extremely intelligent, very well educated in theology and law, and he spoke very, very good German. So his ability to see through this uh, yeah. is made known to his superior, which was uh, Pope Pius XI and Pope Pius the fifth, and Pope Benedict the fifteenth. And before, of, yeah, 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 Pope Benedict the fifteenth sent him to Bavaria, and then when Hitler's rise to power began, Pius XI was the Pope, and it was Pacelli who, after he was called back to the Vatican to become Secretary of State in uh, 1929, um, he advised Pius XII in his policy dealing with Hitler. And the famous encyclical, Mit Brennen der Sorge, which was the harshest condemnation of any political regime in the last 200, 300 years, was written by assistance of Eugenio Pacelli. Actually, Eugenio Pacelli, Secretary of State, Cardinal Secretary of State, um, flew in the most um, prominent anti-Nazi bishops from Germany, which was Bishop Konrad von Preisling, Bishop Bertram, um, Bishop um, uh, von Galen, and um, of course um, uh, Michael von, von Feldhofer from Munich. And um, he asked them to write a draft for the encyclical. You know, most encyclicals are not written personally by the Pope, but drafts are written and the Pope makes corrections here and there. And um, they did it. And then um, he himself um, corrected it and made it even more clear. For example, the original title of Mit Brenda Sorge was With Great Concern, and he changed it into With Burning Concern, what is what Brenda means, burning. Mm -hmm. So um, generally the language um, which was introduced by him um, was a clearer one, a more dramatic um, uh, language to make clear that this is an imminent threat to all humanity. And this uh, encyclical was written in German, uh, the only encyclical ever written in German. And um, when it was printed in Germany and distributed in a secret way, what means that young boys on bicycles took it from the printing house to the parish um, churches. And uh, at that time on Saturday afternoon in every parish church, the, the priest, the uh, parishioner was sitting and, and hearing confessions. And so they went into the confessional and handed him over a copy of the encyclical in the confessional. And the priest was hiding it um, in the tabernacle, and then on Palm Sunday of 1937, it was read in all Germany. And of course, Hitler was extremely angry about it and, and um, uh, nearly cancelled um, the, the Concordate of 1933 and, and, and announced uh, uh, measures against the church. But at least in a time before the Holocaust, in 1937, it made very clear that the doctrine of the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and especially the racism, was unacceptable for every Catholic. And there was no way to be a Catholic and a Nazi at the same time. This was already made clear in 1929, already in 1929, on behalf of the nuncio, an advisor of the nuncio, Eugenio Pocelli, the German bishops, many German bishops, condemned the Nazis and excommunicated members of the Nazi party. They were not allowed, known members of the Nazi party, between 1929 and 1933, in many dioceses and parishes in Germany, were denied the sacraments because um, it was clear but national socialism is a heresy, and you can't be a Catholic and a Nazi at the same time. Yep. And there were also some bishops who seemed to favor or at least, you know, <clears throat> treat the Nazis carefully. Some 
liked the fact that the Nazis were against communism. And so they would support the anti-communism of the Nazis. And there were even a few who had anti-Semitic uh, parts of their personality. And yet even they, some of them, uh, like the uh, Bishop of, uh, Archbishop of Freiburg, uh, was changed as time went on. And it, this gets right. to a second element. While Cardinal Pacelli, Eugenio Pacelli, who later became uh, Pius XII, uh, not only helped write the church's teaching against the Nazis and against anti-Semitism and all racism, which had been consistent in the church's teaching, going back to Paul, uh, they, whom they cited that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. They, they cited St. Paul as the basis for this teaching. But he, another thing that you bring out wonderfully, and uh, it's it sort of built up as you describe the documents, that Cardinal Pacelli in the 1930s, in 38 and 39, was working to help Jews escape Germany. And he uh, it's fascinating the oh, way yeah. you describe oh, yeah. how he did this for Jews who had converted, 200,000 Jews who had converted to Christianity is the way he put it. But there weren't that many converts, there were, there were 200,000 right. Jews in Germany. Right. He was trying to help every Jew escape. Tell us about that. Absolutely. I mean, first of all, I have to say that anti-Semitism and anti-Judaism were two different things. In the church, you had anti-Judaism, which had one ultimate goal, the conversion of the Jews. Mm -hmm. In the Nazi ideology, you had racism, anti-Semitism, and anti-Semitism treated both converted Jews and non-converted Jews equal because they believed in the Jewish race. And in the Catholic teachings, there's no such thing as race. We are all created by God, and we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that's it. No racism. It's an anti-Christian doctrine. And so when the Crystal Night, the Pogrom Night, on 9th of November 1938 happened, he knew it was the beginning of something very, very evil, very dangerous for the Jews in Germany. And so within three weeks, he sent um, a round mail to all the non Jews in uh, the free world and say, please contact your government contact the government of the country in which you are staying and ask for visas for German Jews. There was very few reaction on it. So he, on the, 6th of, uh, sorry, on, on the 9th of January 1939, sent a round letter to all the archbishops of the Catholic world, of the free countries of the Catholic world. And I asked them, we need 200,000 visas for, and he said, non-Aryan Catholics, which means converted Jews, mm -hmm. which of course um, caused the impression that he only cares for converted Jews. But it is not true. It was just a code because if the Nazis would have learned about it, and it was a round mail, which was, you know, rather public, uh, some uh, parishes and, and then some dioceses even published the round letter, so the Nazis could say, look, he is siding with our arch enemy, the Jews, and it would cause the persecution of the church, of the Catholic Church in Germany. So that's why he was wise and used the term we needed for the non-Aryan Catholics. But in the same letter, he said, we need synagogues, we need special schools, and we have to respect their customs and everything, and which, you know, wouldn't fit for Catholics, because in this time, the Catholic right, the Latin right, was everywhere the same. Um, only in the Second Vatican Council you started to, to say Mass in, in the local language. So there was no need for uh, sanctuaries, temples, as the neutral term 
uh, used in the document. So it clearly indicates he is writing not about non-Aryan Catholics, not about converts, but about Jews. And indeed, the number indicates it very clearly, because in Germany we had about 30,000 converts, but we had about 210,000 Jews. So if he gives the number of 200,000, it means he is referring to the Jews, not to the converts. Mm. So what he wanted to do with this round letter, he wanted to get enough visa to evacuate all Jews from Nazi Germany, which is, of course, an, a, a tremendous undertaking. And, you know, it is the greatest humanitarian action in human history if it would have functioned. The problem is it didn't function because the reaction of the governments was negative. They did not issue enough visas. You know, somebody, Brazil offered 3,000, and at the end issued only 2,000, and 3,000 from there, and 1,000 from there, and, and whatever, but not the numbers he needed. Also, the Vatican was willing to pay the expenses for the transfer, because in 1939, Jews were allowed to leave Germany. They were allowed to leave Germany, but without their belongings and without their money. So, of course, they needed money to go to Lisbon to, um, or Genoa and the great harbors for the intercontinental uh, uh, transfer and get a ship to whatever Latin America or Caribbeans or USA. But the ships very often were sent back. We had the famous case of the St. Louis, a, a, a ship full of Jews, which um, was crossing the American coast and was sent back to Germany because nobody wanted them uh, to, to, to enter the harbor and, 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 and wanted to take the Jews. So there was even a big conference in Geneva where all the governments came together and, and the Vatican sent a delegation and said, please, give us visa for the Jews. But the world, the government said, no, we don't want them. So this was a horrible situation because the Vatican was willing to save all of them, but the world didn't want to help, didn't want to support. And of course, the Vatican couldn't, couldn't allow the immigration of 200,000 into their own territory. The Vatican is such a small, it's just a garden, more or less. You know it. And so this was the debacle. This is why this beautiful idea completely went wrong. I, as a matter of fact, I would uh, very shamefully, you know, I, I love my country, but I'm so ashamed that President Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not let those Jews get off the St. Louis, the ship. And Canada would not yeah. take them. Yeah. Australia yeah. would not take them. I mean, the democracies that, uh, as you point out in yeah. your book, are based on immigration. These are nations of immigrants, but they would not take those Jewish yeah. immigrants yeah. because uh, who knows why? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I don't think Roosevelt was anti-Semitic. Uh, he had uh, a, a number of very prominent Jews in his administration, but, and he appointed them to the Supreme Court you know, a, you know, a very important post in our country, and yet he wouldn't let them in. I don't know if he was afraid of offending Hitler or what was going on, but it was shameful. And one of the few countries that took them was uh, Dominican Republic and Haiti, small, poor countries where the pa yeah, apostolic nuncios yeah. took them yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. this was... Yeah, the greatest his... number of Jewish refugees was accepted by the Dominican Republic, yeah. which had a, a dictator, uh, Mr. Trujillo, and um, he, he gave every time um, Venuncio came and visited him and sent him greetings from the Pope, he gave him 800 visas, and this happened every half a year. So altogether about 10,000 Jews were accepted um, in the Dominican Republic, but a, a big country like the USA uh, or Brazil, um, Brazil only accepted at the end 2,000, promised 3,000 visa, but issued only 2,000. So 
this was a great shame because, I mean, these were wonderful people, they are highly educated in Germany. The education level was very high and, and, mm -hmm. and, and these were all good and educated people, which um, would only contribute to uh, the, the culture and, and uh, the wealth of the country. I'd like to give a quote from your book that comes from Pope Pius XII when he had an audience with the apostolic delegates of Egypt and Palestine in July of 1944. So you know, to, it's important for people to understand that date. The Allies had invaded Normandy just a month earlier. And they, uh, uh, they already had invaded Italy and had taken Africa. In fact, my own father was in the African campaign. And so the Allies were making a move, but the Holocaust was still going on. And it was in full swing at this time. And in fact, as, so folks, on your point that you bring out in your book again is that the longer the war went and, and the worse the German army was doing, the faster they tried to kill Jews because he wanted to at least, he said, I can't yeah. conquer the yeah. world, yeah. but I can get rid of the Jews. I, that, that's yeah. how Hitler thought yeah. in his evil. And this yeah. quote from yeah. Pope Pius yeah. Yeah. to yeah. these yeah. delegates from Palestine and Egypt says, quote, we must do everything possible to save the people of Israel but every step must be calculated in advance with yeah. great prudence, for I could not bear the thought that our efforts might lead to the opposite results and cause the death of still more Jews. Now, he made that statement yeah. on the basis of experience with the Dutch bishops in particular and some of the efforts in Poland. Tell us about what happened with the Dutch bishops. Right. Indeed, when the Nazis uh, started with the deportation of Jews in the, in the Netherlands, um, the bishops in general uh, condemned the um, uh, deportations, but um, the Nazis told them to be quiet, and if they were quiet, they would spare the converts, the Catholics who had a Jewish background. And, um, but the Archbishop of Utrecht, um, Bishop de Jong, um, he could not make this difference um, clear with his conscience. And he, in, um, in, in um, his um, homily, and condemned the uh, deportations in public. So the Nazis immediately reacted, and we have the documents from them where they say, because the Catholic Church is speaking on behalf of uh, the Jews, the converts are even the most dangerous ones, and so we start deporting them to Auschwitz. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was how uh, the convert of Edith Stein was invaded, and she was arrested and sent to Auschwitz, St. Edith Stein, mm -hmm. um, a Carmelite um, Jewish convert, Jewish philosopher who became a Carmelite sister. And um, she died in, in the concentration camp of Auschwitz. Um, mm -hmm in the gas chamber um, two days after she arrived there. And um, so he, the Pope learned from the example in, in the Netherlands that any open protest would only have the opposite result. Because, you know, first of all, it was important to save human lives. Human lives beyond all religions. If they are converts or if they are Jews or whatever, human lives. This is what was the most important thing for the Pope. So if there was any kind of backdoor to save, for example, the converts, he used the backdoor. For example, in Romania, in Romania, the Vatican distributed about 20,000 baptism certificates, faked ones, because the Romanian government had agreed not to deport converts, to leave them in their homes. And this was a beautiful opportunity to save human lives mm -hmm. from, from the misery of a deportation. Mm -hmm. Although the Vatican had already before agreed with the Romanian government 
and not to hand them over to the Nazis, but to keep them in the country in Transnistria, which is today Moldavia. Um, a poor region, but still, you know, a region where you could survive. Mm -hmm. And um, we have so many examples where when the church protested, even against the treatment of um, a Catholic priests in a Dachau concentration camp, or the treatment of the Catholic clergy in Poland, whenever the church protested, the Nazis came up with retaliation measures. For example, in Poland, the Poles who left the country, who escaped the country, made pressure on the Vatican and said the Pope, Poland is a Catholic country, the Pope should protest about the Nazi terror in our country. And the Pope did so, and he wrote a beautiful letter of solidarity, which he wanted to be read on the 15th of August, which is the highest um, uh, feast in the summer in Poland, um, Ascension of Our Lady. And um, he transported copies, printed copies, because he knew the printing houses were closed or controlled by the Nazis, to the um, office, to the residence of the Archbishop of um, Krakow, uh, Cardinal Sapieha, by a messenger from the Vatican. And when the cardinal opened the box and they were covered up in a, in a spaghetti box so that the Nazis couldn't, uh, wouldn't control it and believed, you know, this is just a food supply. And when he opened up the box and read the uh, papal letter, he threw all the copies in his cinema and burned them, burned them and said, look, Tell the Holy Father, we are very grateful for his prayer and solidarity, but if I read this in our churches, if I allow our priests to read this letter in our churches, we do not have enough throats for the gallows the Nazis will build afterwards. Yes. What means hundreds of Catholic priests would die the day after. And this is something the Pope did not want to risk. He did not want to buy the applause of the free world and of our generation by the blood of even more innocent victims. Mm -hmm. And this is why his motto was, help, but don't talk about it. Save as many human lives as possible, but be very careful in public statements. He made free public statements in which everybody could understand, but he confirmed the statement of the Allied powers of the 17th of December 1942, mentioning the concentration camps, mentioning the death camps. He confirmed it in free public speeches, but he did not openly say the Nazis are killing the Jews because this would cause this counter-reaction he wanted to avoid. Yes. And this counter-reaction would, of course, end all possibilities of the Catholic Church to help. Hitler even gave order after the Nazis occupied Italy in September 1943 to arrest the Pope and either bring him to Germany or kill him when he openly protests against the um, deportations and killings of the Jews against the Holocaust. So he had to be very careful not because he was afraid to die, he was certainly not, he was ready to become a murderer any day, but it would end all possibilities to save Jews. The infrastructure, which was the only functioning instrument in the Nazi-occupied countries to save, help and save Jews with infrastructure of the Catholic Church would have been immediately annihilated and destroyed by the Nazis in the case of a public protest. And always wonderful modern writers like Professor Katzler, who was sitting three meters away from me in the Vatican archives, nine feet away, and they ignore that we are dealing with a dictatorship, with a complete media control. Today we have the internet. Today everybody in Russia or everybody in whatever kind of, 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 of uh, a dictatorship can still get information from the internet. But at this time, people could only read their local newspapers and listen to the uh, national radio, which was controlled by Dr. Goebbels, 
and watched the news in the cinema, which was controlled by Dr. Goebbels, by the Nazi propaganda minister. So the Germans, the German soldiers, would not hear a word about the papal protest. So the idea, Kerzler is promoting, well, it, they had many Catholics, uh, half of Germans were Catholics, and if the Pope would have protested against the Holocaust, the Catholics would have stopped killing Jews. This is so naive, this is so stupid. First of all, who killed the Jews? The SS. To enter the SS, you had to leave the church. You had to deny your faith before to make a career in the SS because it was anti-Christian, number one. Number two, it wouldn't have reached them. It would not have reached them because there was censorship. That's how a dictatorship in this time functioned, by censorship. So it would not have stopped anybody from participating in the Holocaust, but it would immediately cause the destruction of the Catholic Church and its infrastructure, both in Germany and the Nazi-occupied countries all over Europe. Another, one last factor, we have to take a little break, but one last factor I would also mention. In Hitler's famous book, Mein Kampf, he describes a totally relativistic morality. Morality is whatever you have to do to promote national socialism, and that no matter what uh, feelings you may have of human dignity and such, you have to suppress it in the name of promoting the Reich, the, 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 the German uh, Third Reich. And right. that kind of relativism, absolute relativism, meant that whatever violence it took to accomplish the goals of the Third Reich, you had to do it. And they had zero hesitation. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. you can't underestimate yeah. that factor either. We have to take a little break. We'll be back in just a couple of minutes, Dr. Hezeman. So we ask our audience to please stay with us. Welcome back. We are speaking about a wonderful and extremely important book called The Pope and the Holocaust, Pius XII and the Vatican Secret Archives. It was written by Dr. Michael Hesemann. This book is available at EWTNRC.com, our religious catalog. It is item number 3739. And this book is based on careful reading of the actual documents in the Vatican archives, the Apostolic Archives. We are speaking this, this evening with Dr. Michael Hesemann about that book. And Dr. Hesemann, we've talked about uh, how Cardinal Pacelli had reacted so clearly and negatively to National Socialism, that is, the Nazi Party. We spoke about his efforts to help Jews leave the country of Germany before the war actually began with little help from the Western Allies. And how he, uh, and he did that as soon as he became Pope in uh, 1939, just a few months before the war began. And in fact, it's interesting, he was elected on his 63rd birthday, as you mentioned in there. Um, tough birthday present to become Pope at such a dangerous time. Uh, but the other thing I'd like us to discuss is how he acted as Pope 
during the time of the war to save Jews. Uh, in Europe at, at large, and particularly in Italy. And just so folks understand, Benito Mussolini had, was the dictator of Italy. He, uh, Il Duce, the leader. And he had not been anti-Semitic. He was not committed to destroying the Jews when he began. But the more he craved Adolf Hitler's approval and the more he associated with Hitler, the more he moved toward the anti-Semitism and to imprisoning Jewish people. And in that kind of context, uh, the Pope acts. And then when Benito Mussolini failed to protect Italy from the Allied invasion, the, Wehr, the German Wehrmacht took over the defense of Italy, and basically Mussolini was sidelined until his assassination. So um, what did Pope Pius XII do for the Jews in Italy during the time of Mussolini's uh, uh, attempts to destroy the Jews, and then the, when the Third Reich came in, their attempts to kill the Jews. Um, there was no Holocaust in Italy before September 1943, when um, the Germans took over control over Italy. Mm -hmm. And the agreement between the fascist party of Benito Mussolini and the Vatican was that um, the Jews would be spared. Uh, already the racial laws, which were copied from Germany, um, Mussolini introduced under pressure from Hitler and were protested by the Vatican. And when Hitler in 1938 visited uh, Rome, um, the Pope and Cardinal Secretary of State Pacelli left Rome, went to Castel Gandolfo and said, we are leaving the city because the air is smelling badly because Hitler came. And they closed the Vatican completely. They um, closed the Vatican museums because everybody knew that Hitler was an art lover and there was the danger that he would like to see the Vatican Museum. So they closed it. And in a homily in Castel Gandolfo, Pius XI said, well, the cross, the swastika, which is now on the flags over Rome, is not the cross of Christ. So this was a very open protest against the wizard of Hitler in Rome. And then, of course, in 1942, a situation, and, uh, sorry, in 1943, the situation completely changed when the Germans took over power. And originally, the German, both the town commander of Rome and the commander of the local SS, Mr. Kappler, promised the Vatican that there would not be any um, deportation of the Roman Jews. Indeed, even the chief rabbi and the heads of the Jewish community in Rome were invited into the office of the SS. And um, Kappler said, if you deliver 50 kilograms of gold, we will not touch your community, your synagogue and your community. And they collected 25 kilograms, and then the Vatican offered and said, come, um, we, we give you the other 25 kilograms of gold. And at the end, Catholics collected 25 kilograms of gold, so the Vatican didn't have to bring their own gold. But anyway, um, this was delivered to Kappler, and Kappler promised, OK, nothing will happen. And then only two and a half weeks later, on the 16th of October, 1943, when everybody believed they were safe, in the early hours of the morning, the razzia began. Jews were, over 1,200 Jews were arrested and um, brought into um, a building in Rome and uh, made ready for, for the transportation in the trains to Auschwitz. 
And when this happened, when the Pope learned about it in the early morning, a German principessa, uh, sorry, a Roman principessa, a Roman princess, who witnessed it, and she knew the Pope, and she got access to the papal chapel where the Pope was reading Holy Mass in the morning, and told him about it, and he, with tears in his eyes, said, we immediately have to act. And his um, Secretary of State, Cardinal Malione, called in the German ambassador to the Holy See, Ernst von Weizsäcker, and said, if you don't stop it, we have to protest. And von Weizsäcker said, please don't protest, I will take care for it. But everybody knew in the Vatican that you cannot trust von Weizsäcker. And so the Pope used the second strategy and sent his nephew, Carlo Pacelli, to an Austrian bishop in Rome, Bishop Hudal, who was very close to the Nazis. He was the one who wanted a dialogue with National Socialism because he believed there could be a good alliance between the Catholic Church and the Nazis to fight against Bolshevism, against communism. And because of this, Bishop Hudal became a persona non grata in the Vatican. But now the Vatican could took um, use of him and reminded him that as a bishop, he had to be obedient to the wishes of the Pope. And indeed, um, Huda used his connection to the Roman town commander, the German town commander of Rome, General Stahl, and convinced General Stahl to call Heinrich Himmler and to tell Himmler if he doesn't stop the deportation immediately, there will be a revolt in Rome. And the people would not accept it. And if the Pope would protest, they couldn't control the Italians anymore. And there was the front in Italy against the Allied powers who landed already in the south of Italy. And they needed Italy, they needed the population for the supply of goods to the German army fighting there. So, um, indeed, Himmler accepted this and ordered to stop the deportations at 12 o'clock high noon. Originally, it was supposed to go until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and then the other 6,800 Jews of Rome would have been deported on the following days. They had 8,000 Jews in Rome at that time. Then, thanks to Carlo Pacelli and Bishop Hudal, in General Stahl signed 550 posters saying, Vatican property forbidden to enter for German military and police, what means SS. And they were distributed in the Roman convents and religious houses. So these areas became uh, forbidden to enter for the German SS and military. And the Pope, on the 25th of October, sent a round letter, a round message to all the monasteries in Rome and said, we have to accept Jewish refugees. And altogether, about 4,300 Jews were hidden in 160 Roman convents and the Vatican. And at the end of the 8,000 Jews, only 20%, 1,600, because many did not trust the monetaries but believe they are safer if they stay with neighbors or whatever. But of course, they were not safe, they were found, arrested, and deported. But uh, the incredible number of 6,400 Roman Jews survived. And even the papal summer residence in Castel Gandolfo was open for 3,000 refugees. And, of course, they didn't have 3,000 beds, so they had to sleep on, on the floor, on the stairs, or wherever. But the, the private bedroom of the Pope was given to mothers who were going to give birth. And about 30 children were born in the bed of the Pope, in the residence in Castel Gandolfo. And many of them received the name of Genio or Pio, because this is the man who they deserve their life. So this was the situation in Rome, but because of this immediate reaction of the Pope, 
we Roman Jews, a great number, 80% of Roman Jews, were saved. Poor General Steil, well, Himmler learned about the background from, from Weizsäcker, from the German ambassador. He immediately ordered Stahel to be sent to the front, and he was arrested by the Russians and died as a POW in a Russian prison camp, in a Russian, um, Russian POW camp. Poor man, yeah. but he saved so many lives by his signature. And he, he was an he was a, uh, honorable man. He was a Bavarian Catholic, but serving in the army, not in the SS. So he was against the treatment, the deportation of the Jews. Unfortunately, even, even from this 1250, um, 250 were released by pressure of the Vatican for one or the other reason, but they had a Catholic partner or worked in the Vatican or whatever. But unfortunately, 1,007 were sent to Auschwitz and were killed by the Nazis. Unfortunately, but it was impossible to stop this without endangering the lives of the other 7,000. Mm -hmm. So this was always the, um, the, the uh, dr drama of, uh, and the tragedy of uh, the papal policy to save lives. You had to accept that a certain number still wouldn't be saved, but you could do everything to save the majority. And also in Assisi, some of his posters with the signature of the town commander were sent to Assisi, and also in Assisi, many Jews were saved. Mm. And um, also in Genoa, in Florence, and, and in other cities, the Catholic Church was very active in um, hiding and saving Jews during this nine months of the German occupation of Italy. One of my f Jesuit friends, uh, a theologian named Father Jupp van Beek, was a boy during the war, and he remembers the day of the excommunication of the Nazis. And he said he went to every Mass that Sunday, and there were fist fights over people trying to get to the sacraments, and the priest wouldn't give it to the Nazis. But he also later studied in Italy. Yeah. And his Italian teacher told him, I survived the war as a Dominican monk. And that I wore the Dominican habit through the war because they took me in. And because you're a priest, I cannot charge you tuition. You are my guest. And, and it was many people, and in fact, According to a Jewish Nazi hunter named Pinkus Lapid, whom you quote frequently in your book, Pinkus Lapid said right. that Pope Pius XII saved the lives of more Jews than Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill combined somewhere uh, around uh, eight, right. 700 to 800,000 Jews were saved in Italy and other places yeah, yeah. by his efforts. And I'd, in that response to that, I'd like to give a quote right. from Golda Meir. Golda Meir be later became the prime minister of Israel, and she served in the Israeli government uh, when uh, Pope Pius XII died in 1958. And she, she said, I quote, mm -hmm. when fearful martyrdom came to our people in the decade of Nazi terror, the voice of the Pope was raised for the victims. The life of our times was enriched by a voice speaking out on the great moral truths above the tumult of daily conflict. We mourn a great servant of peace. And calling him a servant of peace is a play on his last name, Pacelli, which, as you again, you point out, uh, sure. Pa sure. Pace is peace Pace, in yeah. Italian. And so he was a, a, a man of peace very much. And it wasn't only Golda Meir 
it was, you know, the president of Israel and uh, all the, the chief rabbi and the Israeli Philharmonic Orchestra played a special concert in his honor uh, in private audience. I mean, yeah, yeah. the Israelis yeah. just honored him so much uh, in the time uh, after the war, did they not? Everybody knew what he did to save Today we can say over 900,000 Jews. So Pinchas Lapid was even careful in his number. Yes. We know from the documents in the Vatican Secret Archives that he worked with 40 diplomatic interventions. You know, in every World War II and the time of the Holocaust, we were not just dealing with the Nazi government. Hitler was a maniac. He was obsessed to kill as many Jews as possible. And of course, the Pope even sent his nuncio, or Senigo, to the Berghof, the mountain residence of Adolf Hitler, and wanted to convince him to spare the Jews. But in the very moment he mentioned Jews, Hitler turned around and was throwing a glass of water on the floor, and the audience was ended. It was not possible to talk to Adolf Hitler. But Hitler had his allies, his vassal governments in France, Vichy France, in Slovakia, in Hungary. Uh, Hungary, in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Italy with Benito Mussolini. And these were the ones which were approached by Pope Pius XII by diplomatic interventions with the goal either to delay or to stop deportations. And sometimes they were really successful. For example, in uh, Bulgaria, and we contacted from two sides the king of Bulgaria through the father confessor of his Catholic wife, who was a Savoy princess, and through Roncalli, who later became Pope John XXIII, who was the nuncio in Constantinople now, but he was the, um, uh, the, the godfather of the crown prince, and both convinced the uh, king of Bulgaria to leave the Jews in the country and not hand them over to the Nazis. And all Bulgarian Jews survived. In Romania, they convinced the government to leave them in the country and deport them to a region called Transnistria, which is today Moldavia, and even to allow thousands of Jewish children to migrate to Palestine, to at that time British occupied Pol Palestine. In um, Hungary, um, first the nuncio tried to convince the government to stop the deportations. We had 850,000 Jews in Hungary. And when this didn't happen, and after the Nazis left Rome, and Rome was liberated by you guys, by the Americans, in June 1944, the Pope sent a personal telegram to the regent of Hungary, Admiral Horthy, and convinced him to stop the deportations in the middle. And even a train on the way to Auschwitz was sent back from the Hungarian-German border. At that time, Austria was a part of Germany, so there was a German-Hungarian border. And the train was sent back to Budapest, and the Jews were released and could go back in the apartments and stay there. And yeah. about 400,000 um, Hungarian Jews were saved. And here we have many, many other examples, examples from Slovakia, from Croatia, from Vichy, France. Yeah. But through this people policy of diplomatic interventions, 100,000 of Jews were saved. Now, then Dr. we had Dr. the Hesemann. policy of helping them to leave the country. About 45,000 Jews were brought out of Nazi-occupied Europe with the help of the Vatican. And of course, hiding Jews, I, hiding Jews either by giving them fake baptism certificates or hiding them in monasteries. Now, Dr. Hesemann, I'm afraid that we are flat out of time, I, but this shows how we could go on uh, because there is so much people need to read this wonderful book. God bless you and thank you for your work. And may the Lord bless you and our audience. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Amen. Thank you for your work and thank you for the support that all of you give us so we can bring you these programs. God bless and good night.